and said unto them, Shall I go up against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Four hundred prophets told him that. Verse 7. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. That was an honest fellow, wasn't it? Somebody said, ain't they a preacher around here that knows God? We can ask what we're supposed to do. And he said, there's this one preacher in town, but I hate him. I appreciate a man that's at least honest enough to say it. Amen? Now, he's wrong, but at least he had enough guts to say what he meant. He hated the preacher, and he said, I hate him. A lot of them hate him and eat him up to his face. But anyway, uh, he said... He doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Hasten hither, Micaiah, the son of Imla. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before them. And Zedekiah, the son of Chenina made him horns of iron. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, With these shalt thou push the Syrians until thou have consumed them. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. He said, All the prophets agree on this thing. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. Listen to what the preacher said, verse 14. But Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? And he said... Okay, here's where he gets down to business. I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did not, I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. And all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one of them said on this manner, and another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also, go forth and do so. Now let me stop right there. That scripture's confused a lot of people. God allowed a lying spirit to go and deceive that king. God, that, that lying spirit was not God's spirit. It's just like when that evil spirit from the Lord troubles Saul, that bothers a lot of people. They say, well, there said an evil spirit come from God. That meant God allowed that evil spirit to trouble that king. God, there's no evil spirit in God. His spirit's good. So I just want to clear that up. Verse 23. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets. 
and the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. See, God allowed them to deceive that king. But Zedekiah, the son of Chenani, went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? And Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see in that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. And the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and carry him back unto Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash the king's son, and say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in the prison, and feed him with bread of affliction, and with water of affliction, till I come in peace. Micaiah said, If thou return it all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, O people, every one of you. Well, that scripture reminds me one of the most unusual stories in the Word of God. I want to bring you a brief message tonight on the subject, Why People Hate the Preacher. You get this up just a little bit, brother. Why People Hate the Preacher. Now, here in this story, you find a perfect example of why people hate the preacher. If a man is called of God, he can expect to have some enemies. All you men that are here called to preach, you might as well expect it. You will not. You will not preach that book and not make some enemies. You don't have to try. You shouldn't try to make enemies. You should just try to be faithful to God. You don't have to try to. You stand for what's right. You're, you're going to have plenty of those that are against you. Now the Bible tells us that we're to take heed that we despise not uh, the preaching of the Word of God. Despise not prophesying. The Bible said, Whosoever despiseth the Word shall be destroyed. This old king here, he has 400 preachers and 400 well-recognized preachers says it's this way. And one preacher stood up and said, No, it's the other way. And they said, it come to find out that one preacher was right and 400 of them was wrong. And they asked that king, what you got against him? And they said, the reason I don't like that guy is because every time I go over there and hear him, he's always saying something that condemns me. He never says anything nice. He never says anything sweet. It's always, you're doing this wrong. You're doing that wrong. You're doing this wrong. You're doing that wrong. And he said, I hate him. Now we have that same spirit in our world tonight. People hate the preacher. Now I want to give you four reasons tonight why people hate the preacher. The first one that I want to give you tonight is the first reason, very simple, if you'll think about it, why people hate the preacher is because they have wicked intentions. People have wicked intentions. And the preacher stands between them and what they want to do. I know why a lot of people hate the preacher. Because he's like a thorn in their flesh. People said, if it wasn't for that preacher screaming and hollering, about every, I could have some fun in life. I could do a lot of things that I really want to enjoy, but he's always down there screaming and yelling and stomping his feet and and blasting me. He'll never tell me something good. He's always evil. Every time I go to hear old leather lungs, we're called by the people that hang around barber shops and places like that. We we've, we've kind of got the nickname of hellfire preachers and condemn nation preachers and prophets of doom and other little nicknames that people have tacked on to us. I want to tell you this evening, brother, they hate the preacher because they themselves have wicked intentions and the preacher won't let them go on and do what they want to do. Let me show you a verse of Scripture over in Ezekiel. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 6. 
And I probably won't have you turn to any other Scripture, so please look at this one with me. This will be well worth your time to turn over there and look at how a preacher preached in the Bible. They look at you nowadays like you are some kind of weirdo if you scream and holler while you preach or if you clap your hands or, or if you stomp your feet. And they, they look at you like you just don't know what you're doing. But if you'll look with me in Ezekiel chapter 6, I want to show you how, what God told His preacher to do. I know that everybody in here probably knows a lot of you. Isaiah 58 verse 1, where God told Isaiah, Cry aloud, spare not. You know what that means? He said, Isaiah, lift up your voice like a trumpet, like everything go by, hey, like that, boy. And he said, show my people their transgressions and don't spare. Let her rip, son. Just haul off, get you a big deep breath, and just let the chips fall where they will. And that's what he done. Look here at Ezekiel chapter 6 and verse number, oh, I believe somewhere there about verse 11, I think. Look at here. Look at what the Lord told Ezekiel. Everybody got your Bible? Look at it. You don't believe this in the Bible, some of you. Thus saith the Lord, smite with thine hand, stamp with thy foot, and say, Alas, for all the abominations of the house of Israel. You see that? You know what God told Ezekiel? He said, Ezekiel, you slap your hands. He said, you stomp your feet. He said, you get up and you say, Alas! for all the abominations of the house of Israel. You know, in downtown Charlotte tonight, down, uh, downtown Asheville, North Carolina, if a preacher gets up in an average church tonight, what if a preacher got up in some of these big synagogue type outfits, probably in Rochester, where these folks are from, and got up there and he said, that's Lord, man, they would run him out of there. They would have that guy run out of town on a rail. But yet God told His preacher to preach that way. I'm telling you, that shows how far we've got away from the Bible in so-called churches tonight. God said in the book, stomp your feet, clap your hands, show people what they're doing wrong. That's a preacher's job. And people hate the preacher because people have wicked intentions. Now, if you're sitting out there, you were committing adultery seven days a week, and I got up here and I said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. I would not be your favorite man in town. I'm not going to expect to get any awards. The way to get a, the way to be a, a get preacher awards is be real sweet and nice and talk about the love of God. And it's all, we're just so wonderful. And everybody's so sweet. But brother, there's no preacher in the Bible that preached that way. You know, I, I don't know what some people think a preacher's job is. I think some people think a preacher's job is to entertain them. I believe they sit back every Sunday and say, well, he done good today. Well, he didn't do good today. Well, I really enjoyed that one today. But I thought last Sunday's was a little bit better. Hey, man, you're missing the whole thing. God is supposed to be talking to your heart through the preaching. I'm not on trial up here tonight to see how good of a sermon I can preach. And if you're looking at it that way, you're out completely. You're supposed to be listening to the Spirit of God as God speaks through His Word. And a lot of people do that. They judge a preacher. Your job is not to evaluate the preacher. Your job is to listen and what God said in His Word, then get you, get lined up with it and do what's right. I don't even know why some churches even have a preacher. They don't listen to him. They don't do a thing he says. I don't see why they waste their time paying him a salary. They'll just cut it out and sing the whole service and give that money to a missionary. They have no intentions of doing what the preacher said. That's why you sitting right here tonight. You're not going to change. It don't matter what I say. It don't matter what another preacher said. You say, I, uh, well, let's, I dare you. See if you can charge me spiritually, Brother Danny. I'm here. You're, you've been full of the world all week long. And you come in here and you just said, well, uh, let's see if you can get me right. I want to tell you what, friend, that is, your job is to listen to God. Heard about this one preacher. I thought about doing this myself. This one preacher, he hadn't been in a church very long. And uh, 
He was their new pastor. He got up first Sunday morning and he preached on something, I don't know, prayer or something like that. And boy, he brought a good message. And everybody was so pleased with the new pastor and what a great, wonderful message he preached. And everybody went, yes, that was very good. They shook his hand, my, that was wonderful. Everything went real good till the next Sunday morning. Sunday morning, second Sunday morning come around, that preacher got up and read the very same scripture. There's a couple of people beginning to notice it. Some of them looked at each other. They said, well, maybe he's preaching a series or something. He preached the same title, had the same outline, had the very same illustrate. He preached the same sermon. And, and about halfway through it, people started saying, didn't he preach it? Shh, shh. Don't, don't let him see you. He's a young preacher. He probably just forgot about it. And he don't realize. And on the way home, people were sniggering. And they were saying, did you know he preached that very same sermon last Sunday morning? And they said, now listen, I bet no, no, nobody say nothing about it. The man's nervous. He's a brand new pastor in town. And, uh, I mean, anybody can make a mistake. Just let him slide. Well, third Sunday morning rolled around. And lo and behold, he got up, read the th- very same scripture, preached the very same to, I mean, almost identical. And by this time, everybody was going, man, this guy's weird. Three Sundays in a row, he preached the very same sermon. What, what is it with this guy? Well, fourth Sunday morning, he preached the very same sermon. And finally they told the deacon, they said, somebody's going to have to say something. This is embarrassing. Our visitors are coming. He, the man gets up and preaches the same sermon. And so somebody told him, they said, preacher, now listen, please don't take this wrong. I'm not trying to jump on you. or uh, Lord knows I wouldn't try to hurt you for nothing in the world. But uh, brother, have you noticed? Did you know you preach the same sermon? I, I'm not trying to be judging you or nothing, but you have preached the same sermon for four Sundays in a row. And he said, yeah, sure, I know it. And they said, oh, you did know it? He said, well, sure, I know you think I'm an idiot. I know I preached the same sermon four Sundays. They said, okay, I just want to mention it to you. So the next Sunday morning he got up and he said, now, ladies and gentlemen, it has been brought to my attention that some of you have noticed that I've preached the same sermon four Sundays in a row. And he said, uh, I think some of you probably thought that I had a lapse of memory or something bad, terrible happened to my brain during the week and I forgot that I preached it a Sunday before. But he said, the truth is, folks, he said, uh, 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 I preached that sermon the first Sunday morning and you didn't do nothing about it. I preached that sermon the second Sunday morning and you didn't do nothing about it. I preached that Sunday the third Sunday morning. You still didn't do nothing about it. And the fourth Sunday morning, you still didn't do nothing. He said, I ain't no use in me preaching nothing else until we get this first and took care of. Amen? And that's about the truth, brother. I mean, I'm not supposed to get up here and just have a nice little topic for you to listen to and enjoy every Sunday. Let's do something about what the preacher says once in a while. I mean, if we preach on prayer, you ought to pray. If we preach on soul winning, you ought to knock on the door. If we preach on giving, you ought to give. The reason they hate the preachers because they have wicked intention. I heard a, I heard a little boy one time, a little boy turned around, he told his mom, he said, Mom, I'm going to be a preacher when I grow up. She said, Really? Why, son? He said, Well, I've got to go to church anyway. It looks more fun to stand up there and scream and yell to everybody than it does to have to sit on the pew. And that's what a lot of people think a preacher is. They think it's just some kind of a little one that can play well upon an instrument, you know. Somebody else say, I like, uh, I like what old, uh, one, one preacher, old Jack Woods out there. Boy, in Texas now, there's this fellow that uh, moved from here to Texas and I told him, I, he said, I'm moving to Houston. I said, there's a preacher out there. You ought to go to his church. His name's Jack Wood. He's pastor of Shady Acres Baptist Church in Houston, Texas. And some of you know Brother Wood and how, how he is. And boy, I'll tell you, oh, I seen that man about a year later. I said, did you go to that church? And he said, I sure did. I said, how'd you like it? He said, that man's crazy. I said, what do you mean? He said, he, he, the, night, the Sunday morning I went to hear him, he took out his pocket knife and was stabbing it in the church walls. And he's cutting it up and stabbing it and ripping it up. He said, that man's crazy. I said, what was he doing that for? He said he was preaching a sermon on gossip. And he said he took out his pocket knife. He said Brother Jack took out his pocket knife like that, like that. And he said he ran over there and he just started ripping up the wall. And people sitting there and, and gasping. Oh, oh, 
oh, he's defiling the temple and destroying the house of God. He said, listen, you get all upset if I take my pocket knife and make a scratch on the wall. He said, that ain't nothing to what some of you people sitting right in here is doing to this church with your tongue. Amen? That's good preaching, ain't it? Yes, sir, brother. Listen, that's... that's, that's, that's uh, what, that? what is that? Sheet rock over there on that. That ain't going to hurt nobody or help nobody. This carpet ain't. Listen, the church is the people sitting in here tonight. That's right, brother. This ain't no synagogue. This is a building where the church meets. That's why people hate the preacher. Hey, that one old preacher boy, he got up, and I mean, he's a ranting and raving about sin. And he preached and he preached and he, oh Lord, he's on everything. And one lady come out, shook his hand one morning, she said, Pastor, you preach on sin every Sunday. Why don't you ever preach on love once in a while? And so he got up next Sunday morning, he said, it's been brought to my attention that some of you don't like it because I never preach on love. He said, I just want you to know this morning I'm going to start and I'm going to preach on love. He said, the title of my message today is Love, Not the World. And so, boy, he preached a sermon. Oh, Lord. He got off on everything. And don't love you. Don't love that. They tucked it out through that one. And boy, of the second Sunday morning, he said, my second sermon on love, as he said, if you don't love your brother whom you have seen, you don't love God whom you have not seen. And he started talking about loving everybody in the church. And he said, boy, he burned on that one. And then the next Sunday morning, he said, my next sermon on love is that to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, mind, body, and strength. Everything in you is supposed to love God. And boy, I mean, that was a burner. About three Sundays of that, that woman met him at the door. She said, okay, preacher, that's enough on love. Go start preaching on sin again. <laughs> Amen. That's the way it is, brother. That's why people hate the preacher. They just absolutely have wicked intention. Well, he had crossed him in the past and he knew that that man wouldn't let him get by. And I'll tell you something. If you're a visitor here tonight, no matter how bad it irritates you and no matter how mad you get at him sometime, you ought to thank God for a preacher that won't let you get by with sin. He's the best friend you've got. I'm just so mad at our preacher, Brother Danny. He just don't let us do this and won't let us do that. No. Listen, if you've got a man of God that it bothers him when you sin and he preaches about sin, he's your best friend. Thank God for him. There's a lot of hirelings out there that stand in a pulpit every Sunday morning. They don't care how you live. They don't care if you die and go to hell as long as they draw that paycheck and got that retirement plan. Thank God for a man like Micaiah that'll tell him the truth. Even though it got him put in jail. Even though he went against the 400, uh, against the popular doctrine of his day. Micaiah told him. And they hated him because he had wicked intention. Number two, people hate the preacher because he won't compromise to please them. They want him to say something is alright when it's not alright. Don't get me wrong, I'm not against counseling. I counsel every now and then when I have to. It usually don't do a lot of good because most people have already got their mind made up what they're going to do and they're just wanting somebody to agree with them. But about 90% of your counseling would never have to happen if people would just do what the preacher says and what the Bible says is right. Most of the time when people say, I'm going for counseling, I'm not saying all the time now. There are exceptions. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. But most of the time when people go for professional counseling, they're wanting some excuse to get to do something that they know they shouldn't be doing. And I'm telling you what, brother, a man of God won't compromise to please them. There's something wrong with a preacher that nobody hates. Amen? You can take him, put him in prison, like they did John Bunyan, like they did Lester Roloff, like they did Daniel and Peter and Paul, and, and, the, and the church... Uh, uh, the churches... Uh, listen, brother, I know some churches, every time I've ever been, they've got a different preacher. They run off preachers more than Liz runs off husbands. Every time I've ever been, they got a different. They don't lace 
six months. They they last just long enough for the preacher to find out how everybody is. And then they're ready to ship him out the door and get somebody else in there they can pull the wool over for about six months. That ain't the way this thing's supposed to work. There is nowhere in the Bible where God tells anybody to tell... uh, Listen, no deacon, no Sunday school teacher has ever been called by God to tell the preacher what he can preach and what he can't preach. That's between him and God. Amen? That's right. That's why what goes on right around this area right here is between me and the Lord. That's all. That's all. He's the one I'm going to answer to. And my job is to tell you the truth in the name of the Lord. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it's not easy. That sermon I preached this morning, that was not easy. I, I met a man coming in the door this morning that has a terrible drug habit. And the devil said, boy, don't you preach that. He'll never come back. And I said, I'm, I believe God laid it on my heart. I'm going to preach it whether he's here or whether he's not here. You know why? Because I believe that if God lays a message on your heart, you're supposed to preach what you know is right because he, we're going to answer to him for it one of these days and not you. And not you. And sometimes it may... It, it may you may think, well, Brother Danny, you just won't, don't understand and all of that. If I tell you the truth in the name of the Lord, I've done more for you than I have if I compromise with you and pat you on the back and tell you you're alright when you ain't alright. Like one preacher told one man, or one man told a preacher, he said, when I hear these great orators, I go away pleased with them. When I come hear you preach, I go away displeased with myself. They don't like the preacher. They hate the preacher. I'm going to give you nothing here. They hate the preacher because they can't control him. The world cannot stand a preacher that they can't control. Now, if you'll be a good little boy and do what everybody wants you to do, you're just the finest little thing ever was, and you get invited to a lot of fellowships, and you get patted on the back, and a lot like that. But I tell you what, boy, if you don't fit into their little mold, and if you try to do what God wants you to do, if it happens to be against the grain, they hate you because they can't control you. You know one of the you know one of the thing reasons why God's blessed our church because we've refused to let outside groups control this church. It ain't none of their business what we do here. It ain't none of no hierarchy's business what goes on inside these four walls. Hey, I know churches. Somebody told me the other day. They said they said they was getting ready to this little country church. They was going to vote the preacher out. They got mad at him, and he said they was going to vote on him one Sunday morning. And said they went out and got people that hadn't been to church in years. You've heard of that, ain't you? I mean, people hadn't been to church in years. Got them out of rest homes, man. Brought them in in wheelchairs to vote the man of God out. What do you think God thinks about that? Huh? What? You, somebody's going to answer to God for that kind of mess one of these days. I'm telling you, they can't control him. They hate it. I've had people ever since I've been saved. You know what a man told me down at the camp meeting one night? When I just started preaching, he said, Now, Danny, you, you make it. I don't know what he thought I was trying to make. He, he said, You've got charisma. Something like that, you know. He said, You need to go to Bible school and get some of those rough edges knocked off. And you know what that means? Let them sand you down where you don't, you know, don't ever stick nobody. You're just smooth. <laughs> You're just like a mole, you know, sliding in his hole at night. You don't offend nobody. You don't, I don't know if I've ever got them rough edges knocked off or not. If God wanted them off, thank God. But if He didn't, they ain't supposed to be off. There's something wrong. There's something wrong with a little nice preacher that everybody loves. There's something wrong, but I'm not trying to be, I don't think preacher ought to be hateful, but people can't stand the preacher that they can't control. As long as you'll be nice and do everything they want you to do, you're the greatest. If you ever cross them, boy, you're out right then. I, I had, uh, I catch it all the time, you know, and I ain't complaining. God's been good to me. Uh, I'm gone so much, I don't even get to keep up on the latest gossip. <laughs> and if you stay busy enough, you don't have to worry about it. Thank God. 
But boy, there's people in this town, ever since we started our church, I, I won't name any individual groups, but they'd say, why don't you be one of us and we can get money to help you and support you and we can do this, we can do that. And I never did feel like God wanted us. I never did felt like God wanted our church to feel like we was had to answer to somebody down here on this earth. I always thought we were going to answer to God and it's none of, if people don't come here, it ain't none of their business what goes on here. They ain't got no business writing us letters saying, if you don't do this and don't do that, you're out of fully on their group, man. We know, we, uh, speak, you know, I had a guy write me the other day, he said, you're in the Baptist denomination. That guy's a nut. We ain't in no denomination. Did you know as far as the state of North Carolina is concerned, this church don't even exist? We're in hell and hell. We're not even here. Thank God, I'm glad they don't know we're here. The less they know, the better off we are. It ain't no other business what goes on here. This is God's work. Started by God. Blessed by God. Ordained by God. And it's none of nobody else's business what goes on in here. Somebody said, you know what I had a preacher tell me the other day? He said, Danny, I'm, I'm not trying to be nosy or anything, but I heard. A preacher, pastor of a church, told me this. He said, it's going around. He said, uh, that your church bought your daughter a brand new sports car on her birthday. That's what he said. You know, and every time somebody says something like that, the devil gets in me a little bit. I want to say, yeah, it's a Ferrari, man. $250,000. And I've done it without even them voting on it. That's what I wanted to say. And I want to say, who cares what somebody thinks? I said, well, brother, the truth is, you know, my, she goes to school 18 miles from here, and a friend of mine, where I go preach every year, offered me a deal on an 86 Toyota. And I said, it was absolutely a deal I couldn't refuse. I mean, I couldn't refuse it. It was less than half price. He said, pay me what you can, when you can, $20 a month, whatever. No interest. Pay as long as you want to to pay it. And I said, man, if he wasn't such a good friend, I just got it and sold it and doubled my money back. I didn't want to hurt his feelings. And I said, so that's where the car come from. I said, the church had absolutely nothing to do with it. The church don't pay for her car, her gas, her insurance. The only time the church do anything if I was driving it. On a trip or something, if it had to be my vehicle. I said, that's not true. I said, it's amazing how some people... I said, uh, what, are they jealous or something? I mean, what if the church did buy my girl a, a sports car? It's none of nobody's business. She probably deserves it some more than some of those preachers do. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> what if we did? What if we voted to put a $10 million chandelier in the middle of the room? So what? I mean, we ain't done it, but what if we did? Let me tell you something. People can't stand a preacher or a church that they can't control. But if you ever get to where the group controls you, then God ain't controlling you. Somebody told me the other day, they said, they heard the church paid for my wedding. <laughs> I said, not! <laughs> you, know, I, you know, if you want, you want information on that, see me after the service. It's amazing how ignorant and jealous some people are. And by the grace of God, I've tried to do that all these years. By the grace of God, I'll continue to do that. And by, my, by the grace of God, I want to do like this man of God did here in the, in the Word of God. Boy, I tell you, some things have been bothering me lately about what's been going on and uh, about the uh, election year, this coming election. Since this is an independent Baptist church and we don't answer to nobody, I think it'd be right and, and honorable if I just spoke my piece. Okay? I was gone this week, but I just seen the headlines of the newspapers. And I saw in the newspaper what was going on. I saw where that day where it said, Ross Perot drops out of the race. I said, hey, here. Now, I ain't been keeping up with this stuff much. 
But you got, if you're a Christian, you got a little beeper inside you. And this little beeper can tell you what's right and what's wrong if you listen to it. And I'm going to tell you what's going on right now. Now, some of you ain't going to like this. And some of you are going to think that I'm overstepping my bounds and that I have no business preaching on politics. But you can show me that in the Bible. Boy, up there in the mountains, you preach on politics. Son, they'd vote for the devil if he's a Democrat. Or if he's a Republican, if whatever they are, brother, it don't matter what point. No, that ain't right. And there ain't nowhere in the Bible where it says a preacher ain't supposed to preach on politics. And there ain't nowhere in the Bible where it says the church ain't supposed to be involved in politics. The Constitution wasn't written to keep the church out of politics. The Constitution was given to keep the, the government out of the church. We got it all wrong. So here's what's going on in a nutshell. We are the first generation in the history of this nation. We are going to see an election decided this fall by one issue. And that issue is kill babies or don't kill babies. That's what's going to determine who gets in the White House. Lord, have mercy. Who would have ever thought we'd have got that low in America? I'm getting, when I go to big cities, and I'm going to Los Angeles next Saturday night, and buddy, when I see them big old tall buildings, it's just like there's this evil organ music playing. You can almost hear it. And you can just see this big hissing serpent going around them buildings. It's evil, man. It's wicked. When you get off the airplane in the big city, you can feel it. It's thick. I bet you if I went to Rochester, I could feel a difference in what I feel here in this little town where we live. Just wickedness and thick. In the air, brother, it's in the air. That's wickedness in high places. And buddy, we're living in a generation where that old serpent, the issue that will decide who gets in the White House now is abortion. One man's for it, the other man's against it. And they interviewed old Perot the other night, and I, like I said, I didn't see the news, I didn't read the paper, I just saw the headline, but I just caught one little bit of one interview. And they said, what do you think about people that's going to go ahead and vote for you? And he said, well, just let them know who that's a vote for. What he's saying is, if you vote for me now, you're voting for Bush, because he wants all his supporters to vote for Clinton. So Bush can be put on. Now, he didn't say that, but that's the message that's coming out. And the news media, by and large, is in favor of Bill Clinton becoming our next president. Now, I don't know that man. I don't, I don't really know a whole lot about him. I know enough. Amen? I know if a man will be unfaithful to his wife and betray his family for years, that he couldn't be trusted to run the nation. Amen. Well, preacher, I don't care what you are. I don't think a preacher ought to go start you a church and preach anything you want to. Man can't be trust trust his wife. He can't be trusted to run the country. I'm not saying George Bush is perfect. Lord knows he's not. I'm not saying I agree with everything he does or believes in. But I'm saying the news media. Here's what they done the other night. Now you watch them, it's very subtle. They're supposed to give fairness and all this stuff. So the guy comes on. On CNN headline news. We have just done our latest report that in the polls, Mr. Bush's favorite is favoritism is falling. Bill Clinton rushes ahead and then and people what do you what is your response to what's happened in Ross Perot dropping out of the presidential race? Ma'am. And it starts interviewing these quick line. You know where they have one line? This one woman says, Well, I'm sad to say it, but I think we need a change. The next one comes on. I think we're ready for a change. The next one comes on. I think we're ready for a change. The next one comes on. I think we're ready for a change. You get hit with about five of them at the very first. That's to plant the message in the minds of American people. Everybody feels this way. And then they put one guy, I saw this on TV the other night, they put about one guy on there that said, well, I think we do need change, but that doesn't mean that any one candidate has all the answers. 
And that's all they put for Bush and about five for Clinton. That means the news media is for Clinton. Now keep that in mind in the next few months. You want to tell, you want to tell subtle that message comes through. They could never say we endorse this candidate. No, no. They're fair. They're very fair in their treatment of those type of things. But boy, it, it doesn't take a very smart person to figure out. If I want to plant a message in your mind tonight, and I had five young people come up here and say, the Bible's the Word of God. Next thing, the Bible's the Word of God. The next thing, the Bible's the Word of God. And about five of them and them said, well, I've kind of got my doubts. Which... Which message would you think I was trying to get across? And I want to say people hate the preacher because they can't control him. They'd crucify me for saying what I'm saying here tonight. A lot of denominations would mean letters. And the, and the deacons and the, the, the uh, elders in the church would say, Preacher, you can't do that. You'll tear the church all to pieces. I'm telling you, they can't stand a preacher that they can't control. Oh, Lord, like old John Bunyan said, they put him in jail. He said, you let me out today? They said, "If we'll let you out today if you'll quit preaching. He said, you let me out today and I'll preach tomorrow. They went down not long after that, I think, said, we'll let you out if you'll promise not to preach. He said, you let me out today, I'll preach tomorrow. They hate somebody like that. What are you going to do with a guy like that? Kill him? There's a bunch of people get saved at his funeral. You can't do nothing with him. They can't control him. Boy, I tell you, you think this world ain't prejudiced? You know, when you mention the word prejudice nowadays, people automatically think that it's a white person despising a black person. There's a lot more prejudice than that, bud. But if we're in the minority, a group that's not getting our say so. Amen? I have a... Uh, they said Bill Clinton put his approval on gay rights the other way, other day, by the way. And abortion, by the way. Amen. You say, well, you can't, I, I ain't politicking, brother. I'm telling you the truth. That's my job. You're supposed to be an informed people. And, you know, I'll probably have somebody get mad at me, but that shows how dumb people are nowadays. They don't want the truth. That's the truth. Truth. What do you want a preacher to do? Get up here and lie to you? What good would that do? There's enough of that. Um, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, about prejudice. I had on my. I got me this shirt made in Florida about a year ago. It's real big. Got this real big Bible on the front of it with a sword across it, and it says, "I'd rather be preaching." You know, everybody says, "I'd rather be skiing." I'd rather be the. Uh, I'd rather be preaching, boy. I'd, and I, me and uh, Corey went to the trade lot yesterday. I had to, I was hunting me a telephone, get me a decent answering machine. Every one I get tires up and don't work half the time. So I went down there. I thought I'd get me a good deal on one. And we just walked through there, and I wore that shirt. Boy, did I get some eyes! You know, there's people that make t-shirts and stuff down there, and every, they'd look at me. And I got me and her a funnel cake. And me and her was gonna sit, me and Corey was gonna sit down and eat this funnel cake and drink a Pepsi. And we sit down there and I ordered it and this woman said, you'd rather be preaching? And I said, yeah. And the reason I'm in it because, you know, when I'm preaching is really the only time I really feel like right, I'm right with God. <laughs> and I want to be doing something for the Lord, you know. And, uh, I said, yep. And she said, well, that's nice, you know. And then there was this guy, this guy was doing these Airbrush thing. He had all these big t-shirts. And he's a real hippie guy. Had real long hair. And he had on a Metallica shirt on his back right there. And he was airbrushing. And I, I was walking down like this, you know. And I saw him. He was breaking his neck trying to read what was on my shirt. Because he was getting ideas, you know. He wanted, And he was looking at that thing. And so I just turned it right towards him now. And I, I looked over here a minute. And he read that thing, boy, and there was just a sour look come over his face. And I thought, well, isn't he awful narrow-minded? Yes, sir. How prejudiced. I don't care what... Listen, I could have come down through there and I could have had the dead heads on my shirt. And he'd have said, that's cool, man. I like your shirt, man. That's cool. I could have come down there and said... Save Mother Earth. 
Lord, that ain't the dumbest thing. These tree huggers. God help us. Don't cut this precious tree. Lord, have you drove through Tennessee lately? Anybody thinks we're running out of trees, man, ought to drive from here across the Tennessee. There's plenty of them. I ain't kidding you. There's enough pine trees in Georgia to do everything we'll want to do from now. And you be saved the earth. That's a sickness thing. Everywhere, everywhere I looked down there in Florida last week, it was save the planet. Our mother, the earth doesn't belong to us. We belong to it. I, I saw a bumper sticker said, I said, that ain't true. The earth, we don't belong to it. The, the earth belongs to the Lord. The Bible said the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And I, I seen one of them guys, somebody said they seen a bumper sticker that said, uh, no nukes. Then another bumper sticker said, save the whales. Another bumper sticker said, nuke the whales. <laughs> They're so worried. They're so worried about something becoming extinct. We've done without dinosaurs all these years. It ain't hurt us a bit. Hey, man, there's plenty of bugs, man. Let them be extinct. Who cares? But I thought, boy, isn't that something? Here's these people running around. Hey, I saw a black girl. She's, she had on across her shirt down there at that flea market yesterday. said, I am proud to be a black woman. Now, I mean, there ain't nothing wrong with that. If she's, if she's proud to be a black woman, hallelujah. Who cares? That's great. She ought to be proud of it. If that's what you are, you ought to be proud of it. But what would happen if a girl wore a shirt down through there and said, I am proud to be a white woman? What would happen? Now, you shut your mouth to me about this prejudice business. I'm sick up to here with that junk. You say anything you say. Oh, you're prejudiced. You're you're a nuts. What you are. Then you listen. Ask some of these kids that go to school in Alabama, and they say that they will not. One kid had to have, leave his car at home because he had a rebel flag on his car and wouldn't let him work, drive it to school, friend. You can have a tag with dirty lyrics on it, with a rock singer on it, with a Canadian flag on it, with any other flag you want. That's why they can't, that's why they hate me and hate this church and hate, cause they can't cram their narrow-minded views down our throat. I saw this shirt here that said, uh, uh, the hardest job in America is being a black man. I saw another one said, uh, this and I thought, I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong. If they feel that way, that's fine. I, I never have thought I was better than a black man. God don't love me no better than a black man. But I played ball with black people ever since, before I got saved. I run around with them. I picked them up, took them places. We bring them to church here. We win people to the Lord. We're, we don't think we're any better than they are. We just don't think they're no better than we are. Do you understand that? Well, you know, I told you not long ago about that popular movie, White Men Can't Jump. Boy, that made me mad. You talk about prejudice, brother. You talk about prejudice. Make up a, make up a shirt and say, White man invented the steamship, the locomotive, the automobile, the telephone, went to the moon, all that. And just, just put that on there and see what happens. Proud of your heritage. Start a Miss White America pageant. And the only white girls in it. Start a, start a national white college fund and see how much money you get for it. You would be all I want to tell you, brother, this generation's sick. It's sick. God have mercy on us. You say, boy, you're scaring me to death tonight. That's why I hate to preach you. They can't control what he says. I'd rather quit preaching than to not be able to tell what I think's right and what I think's wrong. My goodness. I never in my life. The Malcolm X t-shirt's all over the place. But you can't wear one that says, I'm white and proud, boy. I think you ought to be, if you're pr- white, you ought to be proud of it. If you're blue, you ought to be proud of it. If you're green, you ought to be proud of it. If you're a Hispanic, you ought to be proud of your national heritage. Yeah, but... Don't condemn somebody if they're not just like you are. 
I'll tell you what it's coming to. And I'm going to just drop this on you tonight. You mark my word. I'll tell you what it's coming to. The pressure is already on these girls in our church. And the pressure and what it's coming to is if you refuse to date or marry somebody of another race, they're going to say you're prejudiced. That's what's coming to. They say, would you do it? No. Well, then you're prejudiced. Not necessarily. You just make your own choices. What if I said I want to? What if I said I want to marry somebody with brown hair? Does that mean I'm prejudiced against everybody else? No. It just means I like somebody with brown hair. Amen. But we're living in a world that won't let you do that. You're crammed into their mold, like it or not. Brother, they're trying to steal our individuality. They're trying to steal our commitment to God and His Word. That's why they hate the preacher. That's why they call me names and write things about me and, you know, things like that. Well, the last thing I'll say tonight, well, two more things right quick. Three, four, whatever it is. He contradicts and condemns the false prophets. People hate the preachers because 400 qualified scholars said one thing and Micah said, no way, you're wrong. They said he was a cult leader. They said he didn't go along with the historic tradition and position of the other prophets, and so on. Elijah called them names. Paul called them slow bellies. Peter uh, called them, uh, and Paul called them hypocrites and liars and things like that. And the reason they hate the preachers is because he contradicts and condemns them. And number five, the last thing I'll say, and I'll be through. I've, I've got to quit. The next reason God hates the preacher. Is because God bears out what He says. And people can't stand that. It's, boy, I hate Him. And I never like what He said. But He always seems to turn out right. Did you know? Did you know there are people all over this town right now that would just absolutely love it if something bad happened to me right now? So they could say, I told you. I knew, I knew he wasn't right. I knew it would tickle him to death. And, of course, something bad may happen to me. I don't know. I deserve it if it does. But I want to tell you something. People can't stand the preacher because he'll say something and God bears it out. And they get mad and get jealous and hate him. They hate him because God bears him out. Elijah come in one day. He didn't have a popular message. It wasn't the message of the hour, the times that people enjoyed. He walked in, slammed his fist down and said, It ain't going to rain for three and a half years. What do you preachers say about it? Oh, he's crazy. He's a cult leader. Leave him alone. Brother, not one drop fell. Moses came in. He said, Thus saith the Lord. Let that water turn to blood. There she went. That's why people hate the preacher. Deep down inside, they know God's on his side. And they hate him. And they'd take his head off just like they did John the Baptist if they thought they'd get away with it. If they thought they'd get away with it. I know, brother, I know my neck stuck out. I know it is. And that Satanism stuff and that rock music stuff I done went all over this country and in foreign countries. And it's a miracle of God. I'm, God's protected me from getting by this long. I mean, I know, I know I'm marked. But I know the God that called me and saved me many years ago. If I'll tell the truth, He'll bear it out. And if it costs me my life, so what? I've got a better one in heaven coming after this one. Why people hate the preacher. I hope you won't be that way. I hope you visitors here will love your preacher. If he tells you the truth, love him, support him, take care of him. God will bless you for it. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you for men of God like Micaiah. Lord, he encourages me tonight and he encourages us to be better servants, better men of God. Lord, we don't want trouble. We don't want fights. We don't want controversy. But Lord, we know there's hardly no way of avoiding it. We pray for men that are standing in these controversial issues. 
around our nation. Some of them ain't even preachers, Lord, but they're taking a stand in high places. Thank you for the pressure that's being put on Congress and on the Senate and the Supreme Court to stand for what's right. Oh, God, let, let, let not evil triumph. Oh, God, we know that no man, no matter who's in the White House, he can't solve the problems of this country. But, God, I pray that your will might be done. God, that you'd keep down evil. Lord, keep it out. Lord, we couldn't care less who's elected or who's not elected, but we just want evil put out. And righteousness exalteth a nation. Dear God, help us in America to get our eyes open. Lord, help us not to descend to such low bestiality behavior as slaughtering little innocent babies. And our morals gone worse than dogs. Oh, God, open our eyes in this country. God, open our hearts. Help us, Lord, to live for Thee. And we'll praise You and thank You for it. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Come on, Brother John, let's sing about one verse of some song tonight. Amen. Thank the Lord for your attention. I hope you got something good tonight. Let's stand and sing. 417. Number 417. 417. Everybody sing. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own His cause or blush to speak His name? And when the battle's over, wish you were a crown. Yes, wish you were a crown. Yes, wish you were a crown. The battle's over, we shall wear a crown in the new Jerusalem. Wear a crown, wear a crown, wear a bright shining crown. And when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown in the new Jerusalem. Boy, that's just the right song. Everybody get it on that next verse and this will probably be our last one. Where's the band? The rest of our drummers going to get over here. Amen, boys. I tell you what, uh, we may have a long battle ahead of us. We don't know. They may be, you know, I, I may talk big tonight, but I'm just flesh. We don't know what we'll do when push comes to shove. I hope and pray by the grace of God, every one of us will stand. If it come right down to it, this old flesh, you can't trust it. God have mercy on us. We need strength that we ain't God. One of them martyrs, they tied him down one time. And they said, you willing to give your life for the Lord? And he said, yeah, I'm willing to give my life for the Lord. And they was tying him down, going to burn him at the stake. And he said, I'm willing to give my life for the Lord. But he said, you better tie me down real tight because my flesh will struggle mightily. You know what he was saying? My spirit's willing, but my flesh is going to try to get loose. God help us. Walk out to the Spirit and not the flesh, okay? We ready? Let's get it. Here we go. Must I be carried to the skies on flat rebeds of me? Say it, folks. While others fought to win the prize and sail through blood, be seen. No, no, no. And when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown. Yes, we shall wear a crown. Yes, we shall wear a crown. And when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown in the new Jerusalem. Wear a crown, wear a crown. 